Thank you very much. And uh, by the way, first of all, Richard Garriott, great to be with you. This is actually my second New York Space Apps. And, uh, uh, and you know, what's, what's really interesting about this year's focus, which is uh, on um, uh, space as it relates back on the Earth, you know, we're in, a, we're in a pretty exciting time in that, as you all probably know, the amount of data we have coming down from space uh, about the Earth is greater in volume than it ever has been and is only increasing and increasing, frankly, rapidly. And so the data analytics associated with that uh, volume of information that's coming down is incredibly important and something that, that you all really will be able to uh, lead the world in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that just by chance uh, and uh, some of the activities that I did in space. So, uh, but the, the main message I want to talk about uh, is kind of my feeling that we really are entering this kind of new golden age of space exploration and even human space exploration. And, and uh, you're going to see a little bit of uh, similarity, of course, between my slides and Anusha's slides since we had uh, a, a fairly similar journey through life and through space. But hopefully I'll, uh, uh, I'll give you some uh, additional information here, too. You know, I'm old enough. I'm 55 years old. So, you know, 50 years ago when Sputnik launched, uh, it really was, uh, you know, a, a, an awesome moment. And that really is also what inspired my father to get into the space program. In fact, I forgot to mention that. I'm also a second generation astronaut. I'm actually the, the uh, only second generation American and I flew with the second, first second generation Russian, although Russia's actually flown another one, so they're Russia's ahead at the moment. But, uh, but Sputnik really is what took my father, who was a Stanford University professor, uh, who was stu studying uh, radio wave propagation in the ionosphere. He was well set up to watch or listen to Sputnik and that inspired him to, to get into the, the early space race. And if you look at the first decade of space race, you know, starting with Sputnik, then Gagarin, and then uh, you know, Alexei Leonov, the first spacewalk, Neil Armstrong on the moon, et cetera, that first decade was incredibly productive. We went from being a species that was locked here on the surface of the planet to becoming spacefaring to landing on another planet. And to pull that off, a ton of new things had to be invented from scratch. You know, materials that could hold cryogenic uh, propellants, pumps to move them around. Uh, an incredible amount of both engineering and fundamental science had to be done. And nowadays, though, those same inventions are incredibly common. In this room, you know, uh, for example, the air conditioning uh, as just a case study, you know, a lot of the materials that were created for holding cryogenic fluids are used in your air conditioners now. So the, the spin-off benefit to the rest of us was enormous. But uh, I would also even say that, that, you know, that Apollo era that I grew up in, I, I think is really what inspired the tech boom. I mean, I, you, you, you notice Anusha allude to, and I'm going to double down on this issue, that a lot of the high-tech entrepreneurs, including ourselves and uh, Elon and Jeff and others who are back in the space program, really were, did get their original inspiration for STEM activities during this Apollo era. But at least for me, and I think a lot of us, you know, we all kind of expected the 2001 vision of the future was going to be our future. This was, you know, we're, you know, uh, you know 15 years ago, we were supposed to already have a, be building these, uh, uh, these giant uh, space stations. And, you know, for a lot of us, it's like, wow, you know, that's kind of sad. You know, what happened? We never made it. Well, to me, what happened is space proved to be, space access proved to be incredibly expensive and also incredibly dangerous. And when, 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 when to do something, it has uh, uh, obviously a high level of expense, and if you couple that with a high level of danger, uh, obviously we shouldn't be surprised if it becomes pretty rare. In addition to that, you look at, you know, for, so, so th that has created the circumstance that for the last 30 years, we've sort of been stuck in my mind in low Earth orbit. And even low Earth orbit is incredibly expensive at the moment. You know, it, we, we paid over $30 billion to build the space station. We pay more than $2 billion a year just to keep it from splashing to the ocean. And when the shuttle was operating, it cost us about $100 million per astronaut to put somebody there. And there was a one out of 70 chance of death each time somebody boarded it. So, you know, the, uh, uh, those, are, those are pretty bad odds. But now, flipping back to my own story a little bit, you know, I, I mentioned my dad was an astronaut. I didn't mention uh, yet that my mother was an artist. And that led me into my first career, having kind of a high-tech father and an artsy mother, led me into what I believe is the quintessential high-tech art, which is video games. And so I've built and sold uh, two game companies. I'm on my third game company now. Uh, but I also simultaneously, like Anusha, I always had my eyes on the stars. I always thought, you know, I'm going to go explore, and I'm going to explore farther and further, 
And so I've built a whole sequence of exploration companies to go to the deep seas and Antarctica. Uh, and I joined with Anusha in place things like the X Prize uh, and a company called Zero G and uh, Space Adventures that took us uh, uh, up to space. And one of the things that I did during all these exploration companies is I also learned not just to how to create companies that open these frontiers, but also how to bring back information and data from these frontiers that was valuable, first of all, just fundamentally valuable to humanity, but also that I could build businesses around. And so I've, I've built businesses that bring back extremophile bacteria from Antarctica or hydrothermal vents uh, to see if it has novel proteins and things that might be useful. Uh, and, uh, you know, just as an example. But I think what Anusha and I and Jeff and Elon all represent is something that I, I stole from another documentary uh, that I, I, that called Orphans of Apollo. People who were inspired by Apollo to wish for this future that never happened. A lot of us went off and built high-tech companies, had some level of success, again, because of that Apollo era. And then as soon as we had the financial wherewithal, we turned right back around and went back to space and said, we're going to fix that future that never happened. And we're going to manifest that 2001 vision of the future. And at least for me, you know, I, uh, how I did it is, uh, uh, you know, my, I mentioned my father's an astronaut, my next door neighbors were astronauts. Uh, in my neighborhood, I lived just a couple blocks outside the front gates of NASA, so I, I didn't think you had to grow up and decide to go to space. I think you just, everybody goes to space when they grow up, you know, no matter what else you're doing. I'm a firefighter, I'm also going to space, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and so I was shocked when one of the NASA doctors told me that because I needed glasses, I was no longer eligible to be an astronaut. And he, that he just sort of kicked me out of the club that my parents and my neighbors and everyone else that I knew was a member of except me. And so at the age of about 13, you know, I, you know, did the, after the seven stages of grief, I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, if I, who is that doctor to be the gatekeeper of space? If I can't go by the NASA rules, I'm gonna have to make my own rules. I'm gonna build my own space agency. And, and of course, uh, uh, at the age of 13, you don't do much about that. But as soon as I started earning money in the video gaming industry, Almost 100% of the personal investing that I have done is in exploration companies and specifically to get people into space, uh, including uh, uh, working with Anusha over at the XPRIZE. And uh, so I committed to my flight in early 2007. And you know, what's interesting about this is I've tried to, been get, trying to get my space into, myself into space for a long time. And eventually when you finally build the company that has the agreements, and you've got the incredibly large amount of money you know, that you have to give away to go, and you make this payment, it still doesn't mean they will let you fly. There's, there's one more thing you have to do, which you have to pass medical qualifications. And in my case, they actually found a disqualifying medical condition after I'd paid all this money that I was never going to get back to Russia. And that was that I, had, I was missing a vein in one lobe of my liver, which uh, if, I was in a spacecraft that depressed could represent an increased probability of internal bleeding and death, and so they said, you cannot go to space. And then they hung up. <laughs> then I got another call that said, well, we have a plan, and that plan is that you have to remove that lobe of your liver. And so I immediately, within 48 hours, I was in the, under a knife getting a, a one lobe of my liver removed and then having to prove that I could survive the high-G centrifuge re-entries almost immediately afterwards. Uh, but by the way, then, then I did get to go into training on the Soyuz, all the aspects of the ISS, the open sea survival training. And uh, you know, it's interesting that you know, Anusha and I, uh, even though we flew privately, we had to pass. We, we trained alongside with all the other astronauts and cosmonauts, all the professional government folks. We had to pass all the same tests. As a crew, we had to pass all the same tests, and so we are absolutely, truly, fully qualified astronauts and cosmonauts. There's no, uh, there are no tourist seats, you know, on board a Soyuz. You know, we, we boarded the vehicle first, we turned it on, we configured all the power and life support. You know, if, uh, if there, there's work that we had to do that if we didn't do, you know, we're not going anywhere or worse. And so, uh, but in any case, in my case, on October 12th, I became the 483rd person to leave the Earth. The whole flight from the ground to space it goes a lot faster than you, take, than you think. It's only about eight and a half minutes. Uh, spent two days on board the incredibly cramped Soyuz uh, before docking. And uh, uh, that's my sort of my little work area. Uh, this tiny little green uh, spot on the wall is where I did most of my work. You know, uh, 
Uh, the galley was originally designed only for three people, and since there's six or more on board usually, you use the floor, you use the ceiling, you use all around to kind of cram around the tiny little galley. Uh, you know, sleeping, there's also where only three little uh, bedrooms, little caiutes, uh, they called them, and, uh, and so the rest of us just sort of camp out somewhere in the space station. Uh, you know, and I would say, you know, it's interesting, Anusha said she, she loved everything about being in space. I, I differ with Anusha on, one th on, on two aspects, really, I would say. Uh, one is, you know, the food's really just not that good. It's mili literally military rations. It's not bad, but it's not better than Earth by any means. And the bathroom facilities are terrible. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm one of the only people afterwards, if you come up to me, I'll tell you the real story about the prob difficulties of going to the bathroom in space. Uh, it's my favorite story to tell, but it's too long here for the presentation. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I also took on a very heavy workload, so I would actually ar argue that I, I contributed more scientifically and I did more uh, commercial work for hire in the sense of revenue generating work than, than most professional astronauts. So I did not go, in my mind, as a tourist. I went as a private commercial astronaut. Uh, and I could also talk about some of those experiments if somebody likes. But one of them was uh, something called protein crystal growth, where I crystallized uh, proteins that are very difficult to, to crystallize in a gravity environment, uh, brought back those crystals and used X-ray diffraction uh, to model them, and that's particularly helpful in uh, drug development as a case study of the value you can create. Uh, you know, since you guys are doing Earth observation stuff, another thing I did is I, uh, I, I flew on the 35th anniversary of my father's Skylab flight, and so I retook photographs from the Skylab record to try to show how the Earth has changed in one generation of space flight. And I work with NASA on that, and I work with the Nature Conservancy and others. I can, again, at a later date, uh, describe uh, that. And I also developed software. It turns out if you want to take pictures out the window from the spacecraft, uh, it's actually hard to know what's, you're going so fast and your tr route of travel is, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, tricky enough. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what you're over. And when astronauts are generally given a, 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 thing, a picture that they want somebody to take a picture of, or a target to take a picture of, they give them a piece of paper, and then you have to go to the window and decide, you know, what's the orientation of this paper, you know, compared to what I see out the window, and, and that's about as good an image as you get, and that's actually not that helpful. And there is a digital thing, but it's mounted on a PC that's, you know, nowhere near the window again, so it's not that helpful. And so if you're looking at it going like, hey, take a picture of Everest, and you're going like, well, you know, it's one of those bumps. Um, <laughs> And so I helped create this piece of software called Windows on Earth, which is sort of like a scrolling map with the targets set in it. And, uh, and so what happened is that my, my tool was so useful, and I uploaded all the data of the targets from everybody else's into my software, that they would often kick me out of the window that normally I was using, just because they would pull rank on me and say, we want to use your software because it's much better for taking pictures of targets. Uh, and so that's me you know, pushed out to take pictures of them using my software to take pictures of mine and their targets. Uh, and uh, you know, I did a lot of experiments with, with kids in homage to my mother, I had to make some art. Uh, but when we talk about these stories, you know, for me, one of the most amazing stories to bring back is something about something, a, a word called the overview effect. I'd never even heard that term until after my flight. But there was something that happened to me and happens to a lot of people when they're up in space looking out the window for extended periods of time that is often referred to as the overview effect that goes something like this. You know, when you, when you look downward out the window, you're only 250 miles up, so it actually feels quite intimate, you know, as you look down at the Earth. Uh, and in fact, I'm always shocked at, at how easy you can see various things. Like if you look down over, over San Francisco, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge, the Alcatraz, Oakland Bay Bridge, a little ship coming into the uh, harbor there, uh, the bay, I should say, and uh, you know, the silt pouring out from the bay. Uh, it really does feel quite intimate. But on the other hand, if you look horizontally towards the limb of the Earth, you not only feel a lot higher, but you also realize certain things like, wow, the atmosphere is really just not that thick. You know, it's only maybe 10 times higher than the clouds we can see looking out the window before you get to the atmosphere being so thin that there's not even enough atoms to refract light. And, and when you see forest fires and other things, you realize how easy it is to kind of pollute that whole air column, you know, top to bottom. And just looking out the window, you feel like there's this fire hose of information about the truth of the reality in which we live just kind of pours into your mind. And so you've, you, for example, feel like you understand how large scale systems like weather moves and like this is out of the Pacific where it's all one temperature, giant lug of water 
uh, creating these very laminar fronts, these very often fractal shapes. And then over the Atlantic, where it's warmer and has various temperatures and other kinds of land to kind of mix it up, you see much more chaotic weather, including these hurricanes that we're forming. You see how the geomorphology of the Earth has evolved. You, you can, you know, the, the seams, the tectonic plates are just sort of laid out in front of you. You kind of, all these things you've seen in textbooks and heard about, you just can see trivially from space. You can see the erosion from water and erosion by wind. And, uh, and then finally, after going around the Earth maybe 200 times, I looked out the window and I happened to be going over my, my hometown of Austin, Texas. And I went, oh wait, look, there's Lake Travis. You know, there's the bend of the river. There's my house. And so I saw not only my house, but I could then, you know, this is the area I grew up for 30 years. And so I know these distances from Houston to Austin to Galveston and Dallas very well. I've hiked it, I've biked it, I've jogged it, I've camped it. And so I'm going, I know this area really well. I know its scale really well. And I've just been paying a lot of attention going around the world about 100 times. And suddenly you realize, I now know the true scale of the Earth by direct observation. And suddenly, it was like being in a movie, where like a, you know, a scary movie where they'll dolly a camera back in a hallway but zoom the lens in to where the actor stays the same size but the hallway sort of collapses around them. And suddenly, I really had this physical reaction to where the scale of reality suddenly collapsed in my mind to this Earth being this very finite, very fragile, very knowable in totality place unlike I had ever thought about the Earth before. And that, at least from my way of explaining, is the overview effect. And, uh, and of course, you also see these other just, uh, just amazing you know, views uh, of the Earth, which I'll take some, uh, uh, just skip through a bit of them. But, uh, but you, know, you know, I think anybody, when you, when, you, when you see the Earth in space like this, you really do, uh, you, 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 you can just sort of see how, you know, humanity, the footprint of humanity is everywhere. And the... The amount of natural resource, including things like fossil water in the deserts that we're pumping up uh, to grow farms that eventually fail because they ran out of water and have to move further downstream in the desert, uh, you know, it's really amazing. So, you know, I would have always described myself as an environmentalist before I flew, but, you know, my devotion to environmental causes has gone way up, you know, because of the chance uh, I had to fly in space. Eventually, there was time to go, undock in Soyuz. As Anusha was describing, the fiery reentry is truly something to behold. You know, as soon as you touch the outer limb of the atmosphere, you know, you are immediately engulfed in this plasma that is hotter than the surface of the sun. And, you know, our shoulders are sitting right next to that window. And, you know, it's only, you know, three inches or so of various panes of glass and quartz. And little, unfortunately, a little uh, vacuum gap because of the shape of the capsule before uh, you... Uh, uh, you know, this plasma that is hotter than the surface of the sun and the vehicle is literally melting around you. Uh, we also had some malfunctions on my reentry, uh, including some smoke that came into the cabin that was kind of exciting, uh, to, you could say. Uh, and then, uh, you know, right as you get very close to the ground, they have these things called, quote, soft landing thrusters that go off just before you collide with the ground at, you know, maybe 30 or 40 miles an hour in a six-ton vehicle that begins to bounce and roll. Uh, and so it is, it is quite a, a, a whomp, you know, when you uh, hit the ground. And, uh, and my dad was there to pick me up. You know, my dad not only helped me plan my flight, he was with me when I boarded the rocket. He ran my mission control team the whole time I was in space. And he was on the rescue helicopters to pick me up. So this was a, one of the, a, 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 not only was it a pinnacle life experience, it was a, a, a mighty fine father-son bonding, you know, uh, event you might imagine. But, you know, I mentioned how Space travel has been so dangerous. Well, in a costly and in a costly and dangerous. Well, this is one of the things that is changing so rapidly right now. You know, for example, if you if you contrast rockets to every other mature form of transportation, you know, planes, boats, trains, and cars. When you run out of gas, you can go to the gas station, fill it up, and then keep going. With a rocket, you burn all of its fuel and then you drop it into the desert and crush it. You know, basically, you've been destroying it. And, you know, imagine if you said every time you run out of gas in your car, you had to crush that car and go buy a new car. Well, none of us would drive very much, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't, only really incredibly valuable things, some emergency services of some kind might be used cars. Otherwise, nobody would use a car. We'd just be riding horses still. And, uh, and the same thing's true for rockets. And that's fortunately what's really changing is all these uh, uh, innovations with uh, SpaceX and Jeff Bezos. 
you know, now making truly fully reusable rockets, which has already dropped the price by about tenfold and probably will drop the price. You know, you know, Elon thinks he can get the price from, instead of 100 million on the shuttle, he can get it down to one or two million on a reusable Falcon, on a, uh, on a uh, uh, Falcon 9 and a Dragon capsule. And, and if he gets close to that, that's already, uh, that's great. And Anusha also talked about uh, ionic propulsion. You know, my, uh, the, the, the reason why rockets are so uh, hard to make reusable is because 90% of the mass is fuel and oxidizer that goes into them. And so if we can, instead of taking the fuel and oxidizer with you, if we can beam energy to the rocket or find an electric s power source, a nuclear source even potentially, to uh, create either heat or electricity to expand a, pro uh, a propellant that you just used to uh, propel out the back, uh, then you can actually create a much higher uh, ISP. And, uh, and that's what's happening now that will not only reduce the flight time to Russia, um, excuse me, to Mars, uh, but, uh, uh, but my wife was working on something to do, this is called external propulsion, where they take grid energy, store it in a battery, convert that to high-power microwaves, use a big antenna array to beam that energy to the belly of a, ro of a space plane, you heat up what would be the heat shield during reentry, flow a propellant through that to make it expand and not eject that out the back. And if you do that, you can actually drop the cost by potentially a whole nother order of magnitude again. So now the price to put a human in space goes from a million dollars to about a hundred thousand dollars. And so if you, if you, if you thought that you know, space was expensive and unattainable to you in the past, you know, we're about to reduce the price 1,000 fold. And I don't care what, you, what kind of work you're doing, whether you want to take yourself or you want to do science, if the price drops 1,000 times, there's a lot more things you'll be able to do in space when it's 1,000 times cheaper than you could do just 10 years ago. And we're coming to this place, this inflection point, where, you know, even on my own flight, you know, I, I paid uh, the price tag when I went was about $30 million, but I earned back something like $5 million. I still lost a lot of money, but if the price gets down under, under $5 million, and I can make a profit, I'm gonna go a lot. And I'll bet a lot of you as entrepreneurs would also go, I'm gonna go too. And if the price gets down another 10 times lower than that, then again, we're all gonna be fighting for the next great idea for things to go do in space. And so I'm gonna go quickly through these just for time, but you know, he, these are some of the things that I think are now gonna be unlocked. You know, not only are we getting into the suborbital tourism days, uh, but I'm a big believer, I wanna go do some space diving right up on a rocket and jump out. Uh, you know, we've got a variety of crewed vehicles, a variety of launch vehicles. There's new laboratories, including uh, Bob Bigelow, Robert Bigelow is putting private habitat space up on the space station. There's work to be done, not only like I did with protein crystal growth, but vaccine development. Uh, you know, there's tons of new constellations going up. Anusha talked also about the, these, this power. I'm also involved in this asteroid mining company that she was mentioning. Uh, and, uh, you know, th when you think of the raw materials that are available in space, you, you all probably know this already, just the, the amount of likely uh, 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 asteroid-based resources that exist is uh, phenomenal. Uh, you know, just an interesting one to talk about is uh, one that orbit orbits one of the Lagrange points uh, near the Earth. Uh, there's issues like planetary defense. You guys may know that there's an asteroid called Apophis that is going to come scarily close to the Earth. It's not only going to come between the Earth and the Moon, but so close that it will be dramatically bent by the gravity of the Earth as it swings by. And that little white bar there is it's the predictable or the unknown amount of error in its path uh, that it will go through. And then that, that same asteroid is going to come back another 10 or 20 years later and come even closer to the Earth. So it's, uh, uh, you know, we really need to start uh, uh, thinking about that. And, you know, it's really funny, I've, 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 I've tried not to get myself excited about Mars, only because it takes decades usually to pull the stuff off, and I'm a big believer that you can't really count on something until it's within one decade, because that's about the longest our government can manage to sustain a vision in any one direction. In fact, even that's pretty hard, but if it's more than a decade off, no one's even going to start paying for it, much less finish it. Uh, but I actually think we can now, I think Mars is now within a decade of, of reach. And so, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm a big believer that, uh, that we can and we should. Uh, and another thing we had, had fun doing and, and uh, kind of a takeaway uh, uh, from Stephen Hawking, who, who's become a good friend right after this flight when we took him on one of our zero-G planes to go out into space. And, and, and I agree like he does, which is it's, it, it's only a matter of time before life is going to be threatened on the Earth. It may be 10 years, it may be a million years, maybe a billion years before that happens, but uh, but whenever it does happen, we really do need to be a multi-planet species. 
Um, that's just a little fun thing about I actually own a chunk of the moon, but that's another story. Uh, and, uh, and I'll wrap up here by just saying, uh, you know, I really do believe we are in this next golden age. I mean, that, that it's not, you know, while the probability that Anusha and I would have succeeded at achieving our dreams, I, I, I think the probability was quite low, but we did it. And, uh, and the probability now for anybody taking up a similar charge is much easier. So, I mean, it's still not easy, but, uh, you know, I know you plan to go. And, and, and uh, you know, I, my, my words to you and anybody else is to say, you know, you chart your path well. Go learn Russian like you already are, obviously already are. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, the probability of closing that loop now is better than it ever has been previously. And it's getting easier every day. So it's not whether or not you'll get a chance to go. It is when you will go and what you will do to uh, generate value or pay for your trip. So thanks. So we, we've got a couple of minutes for Q&A. Again, if you could queue up right here, down the line, carefully. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, you mentioned um, the need for um, a new use of electricity to bring down the cost and also uh, make it possible to reuse the aircraft. I was wondering how helpful do you think the use of piezoelectricity will be um, in that pathway? Um, you know, I hadn't thought about specifically piezoelectric uh, elements, but, uh, but, but yeah, but I think that electric propulsion in general is, will be the next step after chemical rockets. And only just because, uh, if you think about chemical rockets, you know, they obviously create an incredible amount of thrust. I mean, that's why we do it. But there's an upper limit to that thrust, which is the energy you get out of the burning of, say, hydrogen with oxygen. And uh, that's while it's very energetic, it's finite amount of energy. And by beaming energy uh, through, uh, for example, those microwave uh, antennas I was talking about, you know, if you, if you need twice as much heat in the plasma, you just put twice as much power into your array or build a twice as large an array and focus on the same spot. So uh, you, it's, you know, uh, Unlimited would be overstated, but uh, it's obviously a vast uh, improvement over uh, chemical propulsion. But piezoelectric, I don't know specifically what role it would take. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned kind of planetary defense and some of the work that you're doing around protein structures. Um, but I was wondering, what kind of industries do you think will be activated that will change the way that we live through space travel? Yeah. And then a second follow-up mm -hmm. question is, what resources do you recommend to people trying to learn more about? Space travel. Great. So uh, two things on that front. So first is uh, uh, what do I think will be unlocked? So to me, there's two. When you think about space exploration, there is low Earth orbit, and then there is you know farther out on the Moon or Mars or another planetary body, an asteroid perhaps. Uh, in low Earth orbit, there's really only two particularly special things. One is that there's a vacuum out the window, but that can be simulated on Earth. And the other one is that there's uh, you're in microgravity. You know, zero gravity is not quite accurate, but microgravity. And that is really the advantage. An extended stay in microgravity cannot be simulated on Earth. And so to me, that is the value that you must think of. What industries are changed by being in microgravity? And it turns out one of the biggest ones is biology. It turns out that even, even your individual cells, as they're going through mitosis, you know, they, have, they know the vector of gravity, right? They know that this, they, they, their organelles inside your body orient towards gravity. And so if you go try to raise fruit flies or chicken eggs or humans in microgravity, it actually, uh, it's the challenges to life go way up. Uh, and in fact, a lot of disease uh, microbes that are taken into space mutate in ways that makes them far more virulent. And so uh, one of the other slides I put up I didn't really describe was somebody with a tray of eggs that was their uh, company in Austin, Texas doing vaccine development in space. So I think biological research in space is gonna be the first big value. And, and of course, medicine is incredibly valuable to humanity and is incredibly difficult and expensive normally. And so any advantage space can offer uh, is a big deal and very valuable. Uh, there's other materials processing work or at least fundamental science that's uh, coming out of that too, but a little trickier to know when it will monetize. And I'm looking for commercial, I'm looking for the fundamental science is Im Im immense, but requires just perpetual investment, shall we say. I'm looking for those moments where you can take the learning we now have done through space and find a way to monetize it and bring value back directly, uh, which is why biology still is the main one. Then when you go further away, uh, you know, while there will be value in building habitats on Mars and closed-loop closed uh, life, life support systems, et cetera, 
Uh, I actually think that I'm, the one I'm most bullish on is still asteroid mining. I actually think that whether it's, whether it's rare earth metals that we need on earth to make stuff, like you know, catalytic converters for cars, uh, or water to use as fuel and air to breathe uh, in space or on another planetary body, uh, asteroid mining will be it, but that won't happen for 10 or 15 years. So that's a really long-term bet, but that's, a, that's about as long-term a bet as I've ever been involved in, but I, but I believe in it. Uh, and the other question was? Oh yeah, if, if you want to learn. So what I found interesting, so, uh, so uh, uh, while I have received an honorary doctorate since my flight, I'm a college dropout. And so one of the, one of the interesting, uh, I, I dropped out of school to go play games for a living. And uh, uh, which does not mean I'm uneducated, obviously. Uh, I've, 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 uh, I'm a, a very good uh, student, uh, you might say. But what I found interesting about the training and operating in space is that if you can get a scuba diving license, you can handle life support. If you can get a ham radio operator's license, you can handle all the radios. If you can do high school physics, you get orbital mechanics plenty well enough to uh, help you dock a spacecraft. I actually found, other than learning the Russian language, you know, I found nothing of what we were doing to be necessarily that hard. I mean, it's not uh, graduate level work. And even the experience you're involved in, as long as you really are a pretty good student and you have an engineering degree and uh, you know, some uh, medical degree or some medical uh, background would, of course, be useful. You know, being a polyglot who is interested in a wide array of subjects that include hard science and engineering is absolutely helpful. But as is getting out and being an explorer of sorts in the sense of you know, like scuba and ham radio. And, uh, uh, but I think you'll find that, uh, that uh, as long as you have a broad, solid STEM foundation, it almost doesn't matter whether it's really a medical degree or an engineering degree, uh, but they all help. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the overview effect, um, and one of my like, favorite poets, Nikki Giovanni, said that she actually wanted an astronaut to be president because of the way she thought that it would change your view on the world. So I was curious if that happened to you as well, like the way we relate to each other as humans. Or totally agree. Uh, in fact, a lot of times when I just talk about I do talks just on the overview effect, and you know, I believe that if we took, if 1% of humanity could get off this earth and have that experience, it would change the future of civilization. Uh, and uh, yes, you know, just like, you know, I think it'd be great to say, you know, our, our presidents ought to have a certain amount of background and civic duty and responsibility or business or, you know, there's a variety of other resume items you'd like to have on a, with a president. But having seen the earth from space and having the overview effect, uh, I think would also be a great one. Yeah. Hi. Um, so saving the Earth is kind of a daunting task. What are some ways that you think we, as an individual, could help? You know. Well, there, so uh, you know, as you know, you've, I'm sure you've seen those uh, Discovery Program Doomsday uh, Futures uh, programs. They talk about all the possible things that could happen, whether it's a, a biological hazard, a nuclear hazard, or an asteroid hazard. Or five billion years now, obviously the sun will expand and you know will destroy the Earth. So we we definitely have a a, a, a countdown clock going already, and uh, and so what the way I look at it is, there's uh, at least from a space standpoint, you know there is work in biology that I think is good for humanity regardless, and that would help us if there was a, you know, uh, 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 zombie outbreak. Uh, but uh, but if you go at least to the asteroid defense, that one's actually pretty that one's pretty clear what we can do. Uh, we already know with, with Earth-based and some space-based telescopes, we already know about 90%, maybe even 95% of all the asteroids that have orbits that come anywhere near the Earth. But we are missing about 5%. And that's because we have this thing called the sun on one side of us that kind of a, a, obliterates our view in one direction. And so uh, uh, the first thing we can do is support efforts by both amateurs and NASA uh, to uh, get a telescope into space that can look uh, be far enough away from the Earth to kind of see at different angles than we can from the Earth to pick up that last 5%. Because then we'll at least know. We'll know we can we could then eliminate the immediate uh, likelihood of being hit by something big enough to destroy a city or worse. Um, the next part then would be if we do find things like Apophis that are coming mighty, you know, too close for comfort, then you can sit down and go like, well, what do you do about that? And that is also solvable as long as we have at least a year or two's warning which again goes back to the detection problem. So you know, we we already have enough theory and you know uh, reasonably close technology that if we knew that something was going to hit the Earth in two years, we would scramble and fix it. In my mind, so 
that detection can be handled even at an amateur level. A lot of new uh, great work is actually being done by amateurs. So it, I think individuals can do it. Did you have a question too? You had to. Oh, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, the reason why is if you're going up on a Russian Soyuz, so once you're on the International Space Station, everything is labeled bilingually. Uh, and in fact, the, the common language is English. But if you're on the Soyuz, the whole, all the control panels are written only in, in, in Russian. It, your flight data files to how to operate the vehicle are only in Russian. The commands coming to you from mission contr control are only in Russian. And so you darn well better learn enough of it to at least follow along and not forget to press the right button at the right time or uh, you know, really bad things could happen. So, so I learned a little bit of Russian, although it's quickly leaking out of my brain. But I think that's all the time I've got. So thank you all again very much. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>